we we'll listen, we we'll receive, we we'll obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. I welcome you to our Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that the Spirit of the Lord will open the eyes of everyone. Amen. We'll behold great, wonderful, wondrous things out of the world in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. Thank you for your people, our brothers and sisters, our leaders, our workers. And we thank you for the new people who are here tonight with us. We're asking, Lord, that tonight you teach everyone your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Lift us up. Amen. Lead us higher. Amen. Lead us deeper. Amen. Eat your word in Jesus' name. Amen. And grant life eternal to everyone. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless everyone. You can sit down. We're studying from John chapter 6 tonight. And we're reading from verse 41 all through to verse 59. John chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 41. Then the Jews, the Jews then murmured at him. Because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Let's go to verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me has everlasting life. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. Verse 58, this is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. You will live forever. Yeah. We're reading some special words today. These enlightening words, enriching words, energizing words of Jesus Christ. As we study tonight, you'll find the only reaching in the gospel according to St. John. The revelation in this gospel is very deep, sublime, and far-reaching. To saints and sinners alike, the revelation is a mystery. As the Lord Jesus Christ himself declares over and over, I am the bread of life. I am the bread come down from heaven. To those religious Jews that listen to him and to many others like them, it was like blasphemy. And it was a stumbling block for them. Look at John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, reading from verse 33, Look at their attitude. As they had the Lord Jesus Christ speaking these deep sublime words. The Jews in verse 33 answered him saying, For a good word will stone thee not, but for blasphemy. Because that thou being a man makest thyself God. Look at verse 35. If ye call them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, 36, say ye of him, whom the Father has sanctified, and sent into the world, that thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. So you understand the words we're looking at tonight. He said he came from heaven. Is the bread that came from heaven. And the bread you will take, the bread you will eat, the bread you are going to possess and have, and then you have everlasting life. For them it was a stumbling block. They couldn't understand the height and the depth, the length and the breadth of what Jesus Christ was revealing to them. We're told in First Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading here from verse 23 and 24. This will show you the attitude of many people. When they hear words, they cannot understand. 
was they cannot interpret. Verse 23, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. As we read the whole passage tonight, you'll find it was a stumbling block unto them. Then he goes on to say, unto the Jews foolishness, but unto them that are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Come back to John chapter 6. There were religious Jews, or some other kinds of people, shadow disciples and superficial worshippers. Those shadow disciples and those superficial worshippers had one word to say about everything God was revealing in this John chapter 6. Look at verse 60. In verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying. Who can hear it? They were shallow. They didn't understand. They were superficial. And they thought because they couldn't understand, nobody else will understand. In fact, it made them to go back from him. Look at verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They heard the word. They heard the revelation. And he heard the statement that Jesus Christ had made when he said, I am the bread of life. I am the manna that came from heaven. The lack of understanding drove them away from the Lord. We're coming to, we're coming to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I pray you'll not be among those shallow disciples. You'll not be a superficial worshiper. Hearing the word of God, you'll not say, that's so hard, that's so tough, I cannot understand. And because I cannot understand, I'm going back, you will not go back in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. Now the judge shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. If you are so superficial, if you are so shallow, that when you hear the word of God, instead of praying for understanding and praying for wisdom and praying for the spirit of truth and interpretation to interpret unto you, if you drop back because you think that's hard, that's tough, that's difficult, I don't think I can understand that, I don't think I can do that, and then you go back, it says, My soul shall not have any pleasure in you. Look at verse 39. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Those who draw back, what do they draw back to? I said, what do they draw back to? They draw back to perdition. But we are them that believe to the saving of the soul. You see these people, they were running to the Lord Jesus Christ in an earlier verse that we read. They came over the sea and they ran to the Lord and said, Jesus, Master, Rabbi, when did you come over here? And then the Lord now began to tell them the truth. But after running, then they retreated. They went back. They began with running. And they ended up with retreating and going back. I pray that will not happen to you. Let me show you an example of such a person. At the beginning, running, running, running. I come to Christ. I come to Christ. I'm going to follow Christ. Lord, what's the way to life eternal? And then the Lord begins to reveal to them. And then they slow down. And then they stop. Then they turn back. Then they go back because they cannot follow. I will follow. Mark chapter 10. I read from verse 17, Mark chapter 10. We read him from verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one, tell me the word, running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? 
He was looking for eternal life, searching for eternal life, wanting to receive eternal life, wanting to partake and possess of eternal life. And the Lord told him, look at verse 21. Verse 21. And then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One sin thou lackest. He said, You're not far from the kingdom. Just one thing you lack. Take that step, and then you will get into that life eternal. And the Lord told him what you will have to do. You will have to make God number one in his life. He'll have to love God with all his heart, all his soul, and all his mind. He'll have to love God more than silver and gold, and more than anything and anyone here in the world. He'll have to put God as number one. The kingdom of God as number one. Eternal life as number one. That did not go well with him. Look at verse 22. And he was sad at that same. And went away grieved, for he had great possessions. He had put his trust in possession. He had put his faith in possession. He had put his confidence in possession. He had lifted possession, silver and gold, money. He had lifted that to number one in his life, above God, beyond God. And he couldn't put that down so that God will be number one. And because of that, he stopped running and then started retreating. I will not go back. Galatians chapter 5 verse 7. Galatians 5 verse 7. He did run well. Now the apostle Paul is talking to some other believers. Again, these were shallow believers. These were shallow disciples. These were superficial worshippers. He did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. But thank God, there were sincere seekers. Like the people that lack understanding, they don't understand. Just like you may not understand ordinarily, superficially. You may not understand as you read the words of Christ tonight. But you see, there are people that are so sincere, they know they lack understanding, but they want to know. They know they do not have the knowledge they ought to have, but they want to know. And that's why they're speaking like the eunuch of Ethiopia in Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. And we're reading from verse 30 and verse 31. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? No, he didn't understand. Just like the Jews did not understand, just like the superficial worshippers in John chapter 6 did not understand, just like those shadow disciples did not understand. Here Philip was asking the eunuch of Ethiopia, understandest thou what thou readest? Look at verse 31, and he said, how can I? I don't understand. How can I? I don't understand. And any of those Jews could have said the same thing, how can we? We don't want to understand that Jesus Christ said, I am the bread that come from heaven. I am the manna that came from heaven. That Jesus said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. We don't understand. Just like this man said, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him so that he would have understanding. What's the attitude of a true child of God? You read a part of the word of God. It's tough. It's hard. It's difficult. You don't understand. You go on your knees and you pray that the spirit of the living God will interpret the word unto you. And the truth in that word will set you free. The truth in that word will liberate you. Liberate you from ignorance and liberate you from shallowness, and you'll have the depth of the knowledge of the truth of the word of God in Jesus' name. Come back, come back to John chapter 6. The true disciple and the true born again believer, the heavenly pilgrim, abides in Christ. Whatever you hear, whatever you learn, however you understand, however you don't understand, you understand that you are so linked with the Lord Jesus Christ, committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, and even if other people are going back, you will not go back in Jesus' name. We're coming to John chapter 6, verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Do you understand everything? 
Do you comprehend everything? Is it tough and difficult and hard for you? If you don't understand, other people that didn't understand, they've come back. Will you also go away? But 68, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. You're talking about bread of life, I don't understand, but I know you have the words of eternal life. You talk about manna from heaven, I don't fully understand, but you have the words of eternal life. You say you are the living water. If any man thirsts, he should come to you and drink. I don't know the depth and the height of that, but all the same, I know you have the words of life, eternal. You said you came from heaven and you're going back to heaven. I don't understand all the depths of that knowledge, all the same. Thou hast the word of eternal life. To whom shall we go? It's our Savior, He will save us. It's our sanctifier, He will sanctify us. And it's the one that will recreate our lives. It's the resurrection and the life. It's resurrection power and life will come to our lives in Jesus' name. Because here it is what we're sure about that Jesus Christ, the eternal one. Jesus Christ, the living word. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus Christ, the Savior. Jesus Christ, the sanctifier. Jesus Christ, the living bread that came from heaven. He grants us life eternal. And because he grants us life eternal, we're going to abide with him. Look at verse 69. It says, and we believe and are sure. We believe and are sure. Thank God I'm sure tonight. I say thank God I'm sure tonight. We believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Tonight we're looking at this message, the fullness of life from the heavenly manner. Fullness of life from the heavenly manner. The heavenly bread. The heavenly meal, the heavenly food, and we have life through that heavenly manner. We have eternal life, we have abundant life, we have spiritual life, we have everlasting life, we have the very life of God, we have the heavenly life, the fullness of life from the heavenly manner. There are three points we're looking at. Number one, the spiritual stage of murmurers in the heart, the sumomo. The spiritual stage of murmurers in the heart. Point number two. The supernatural strength through the manna from heaven. The supernatural strength through the manna from heaven. Point number three. The sufficient sacrifice of the mediator. Our only hope. The sufficient sacrifice of the mediator our only hope tell me your number one there the spiritual stage of murmurers in the heart we're coming to john chapter 6 and i'm reading from verse 41 to verse 46 john chapter 6 from verse 41 then the Jews they murmured at him on the line that word murmur the, the, the Jews they murmured at him because he said I am the bread that came from heaven and he said it's not this Jesus the son of Joseph whose father and mother we know how is it then that he said I came from heaven that's what brother them that's what confused them that's what they murmured about. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It, it is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught of God. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. You are not just listening to a human teacher. The Almighty God Himself will teach you. The creator of the whole universe Himself will teach you. And the author of Scripture, because the Scripture belongs to God. 
and belongs to the Spirit of God. The Spirit that inspired the Word will teach you Himself in Jesus' name. It says, They shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that has heard and has learned of the Father, cometh unto me. Everyone who has been enlightened by the Father, revealed the truth to you by the Father. Everyone that has heard, that has known, that has learned the truth from the Father, cometh unto me. Not that any man has seen the Father, save except he which is of God. He has seen the Father. Now, as you look at uh, what we are studying tonight, it says, look at verse 41, the Jews then murmured at him. Verse 43, Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not among yourselves. The question is this, the Jews that murmured, and the Gentiles who are murmuring today, saints or sinners, Backsliders or so called believers, those who murmur, why do they murmur? Number one, because of the lack of faith. Those who murmur, they murmur because of the lack of faith. Jesus said, I'm the bread that came from heaven. If they believed that, they will not murmur. Jesus said, For you to have life, you must have me. You must have the bread of life that is a source of life. That is the sustenance of life. That is the sufficiency of your life. If they believe that, they will not murmur. We're looking at Psalm 106. Psalm 106, verse 24 and verse 25. Psalm 106, verse 24. Yea, they despise the pleasant land. Listen to this. They believe not his word. Verse 25. But murmured in their hearts they murmured in their tents and hearkened not unto the voice of the lord you see the reason there why they murmured because they believed not his word and it is still the same today you hear the word of repentance you hear the word of restitution you hear the word of salvation you hear the word of holiness if you murmur it is because number one of the lack of faith number two because of lack of understanding john chapter 6 verse 41 the jews then murmured at him because he had said I am the bread which came down from heaven. I am the bread which came down from heaven. As they looked at Jesus Christ, some of them traced him only to Bethlehem. I didn't think of heaven. As they looked at Jesus Christ, they traced him to Capernaum. As they looked at Jesus Christ, they traced him to Nazareth. And because their mind couldn't understand any place beyond Bethlehem, any place beyond Capernaum, any place beyond Nazareth, they said, he is here. And he came from Nazareth. We know his father, we know his mother. They didn't understand he came from heaven. Because of lack of understanding, that's why the moment, number three, because of lack of revelation. Lack of revelation. Look at verse 42. It says, the sage is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know, how is it that, how is it then that you said, I came from heaven? The large revelation. The large revelation of the wise men that came from the east. And he said, we have seen his time. Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? They need have that revelation. The large revelation of the shepherds that had the singing of the angels. Glory to God in the highest peace on earth. Because this day is born the Christ, the son of David. The large revelation of Simeon that came to the temple and said, let me go now because, because my eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord. Because of the lack of revelation, that's why they murmured, number four. They murmured because they large conversion. They large conversion. There's no change of heart. 
no change of life. And because the Lord had not touched them to transform them. Look at John chapter 6 verse 43. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Move not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent, which sent me. Draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. He said, you know your problem? You're not converted. You know your problem? The Father has not drawn you. You know your problem? Your heart, your life, your spirit has not been drawn to, to me by the Father. Because the large conversion. Number five, because of the lack of divine impartation. Lack of divine impartation. That's why they couldn't understand. That's why they couldn't see that this is Jesus, the very Son of God, and the bread of life that came from heaven. Look at verse 45 there. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. That's how divine revelation comes. When you are taught of God, the truth you couldn't know from your history books, the truth you couldn't know from your educational institution, the truth you couldn't know from religion, from synagogues, the truth you couldn't know by another man passing that to you, the almighty God himself. He divinely imparts your life and then he grants you enlightenment, revelation, inspiration that to say, yes, I see. Yes, I see. I pray that tonight you will see. There will be a divine impartation in your soul, in your spirit, in Jesus' name. That's what Jesus said in the latter part of that verse 45. Every man, therefore, that has heard and has learned of the Father, cometh unto me. There will be no confusion in your heart. When that divine impartation is there, look at verse 46. Not that any man has seen this, the Father, save he which is of God. He has seen the Father. And then the reason why they didn't have uh, this revelation in them, uh, number six, the large conviction. The large conviction. And look at chapter seven. Chapter seven of John. John chapter seven, verses 12 and 13. And there was much murmuring among the people. You see that? Much murmuring among the people concerning him for some said he's a good man others said nay but he deceives the people albeit no man speak openly of him for fear of the jews for fear of the jews the large conviction and because there's no conviction that's why the murmured number seven the large perseverance perseverance in the way you come out of the world you come out of egypt and then you're going to the promised land you're going to canaan if you have conviction and if you have perseverance you continue you continue there'll be no murmuring first corinthians chapter 10 in first corinthians chapter 10 i'm reading here from verse 10 neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured, and they were destroyed of the destroyer. It's telling us that murmuring is costly. Murmuring is terrible. If you are murmuring, here is what will follow. There will be destruction. You know why? Because you lack faith. You know why? Because you lack understanding. You know why? Because you lack revelation. You know why? Because you lack conversion. Because you lack divine impartation. You lack conviction. And you lack perseverance. You're not enduring to the end. Those who murmur, they're saying, I want to go back. I don't understand again. This is too tough for me. This is too difficult for me. And this is hard. They lack perseverance. Look at that. First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 10. Neither murmur ye. As some of them also murmured. And they were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them. For example, and they are reaching for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let, the, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, take heed, lest they fall. You will not fall. Amen. Philippians chapter 2. 
Philippians chapter 2, the large true spirituality. The large true spirituality. We're looking at Philippians chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 12. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 12. It says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation. Tell me. Yeah. Tell me out loud. Yeah. You see, remember those who murmured in the past. Remember those who grumbled in the past. Remember those complainers in the past. They were not able to get to the land of Canaan, to the promised land. And you want to get to that land, thank God you will get there. It says, it goes on to say, for it is God which walketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Verse 14, everybody read, one, two, three, go. You see that? It says, if you are walking out your salvation with fear and trembling, there's something that will not be found in your life. You're not going to make a habit of murmuring. And it says, you do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Your pastors will not labor in vain over you. Your overseers will not labor in vain over you. The preachers and teachers of the word will not labor in vain over you in Jesus' name. You know why they murmured? Number one, they lacked faith. Number two, they lacked understanding. Number three, the large revelation. Number four, the large conversion. Number five, the large divine impartation. Number six, the large conviction. Number seven, the large perseverance. Number eight, the large true spirituality. Number nine, the large godliness and readiness for heaven. The large godliness and readiness for heaven. A person who is uh, very close to heaven has nothing to do with murmuring. A person that wants to be at the party gaze in heaven, it doesn't have anything to do with murmuring. A person who wants to be ready when the trumpet shall sound, it doesn't have anything to do with murmuring. The people who murmur, they do not have the needed godliness as well as the readiness to get to heaven. Jude has only one chapter. Jude chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 12. These are sports in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, whose fruit eh, without fruit twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea. Forming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved, tell me, the blackness of darkness forever. What's another name for that? I said, what's another name for that? You see now, a hell, and it goes on to say, and Enoch also, the servant from Adam prophesied of this saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. And of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Tell me the first line of verse 16. Tell me out loud. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's business in admiration because of advantage you see the danger of murmuring you see the doom the damnation of murmuring and you see the end result of murmuring what were they murmuring about come back to john chapter 6 john chapter 6 let's look at what they were murmuring about 
We're reading from verse 41 again. John chapter 6, verse 41. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, What did he say? I am the bread which came down from heaven. That was their problem. Look at the latter part of verse 42. Latter part of verse 42. How is it then that he said, I came down from heaven? heaven that was their problem look at verse 48 i am the bridge of life they should have thought in their heart if jesus repeated this over and over over and over there must be something to this look at verse 50 in verse 50 this is the bridge which cometh down from heaven that a man be each thereof and not die you'll have spiritual life you'll have eternal life and you'll have the life that comes from heaven in jesus name look at verse 51 i am the living bread which came down from heaven very clear i am the living bread which came down from heaven if any man eat of this bread he shall live forever and the bread that i will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Look at verse 58. In verse 58, this is that bread which came down from heaven. Uh, look up here for a moment. We need to learn something here from Jesus Christ. Jesus said it in verse 41. He had said it in verse 33, verse 35. And he didn't understand. And they murmured and they grumbled. But Jesus did not change the truth. To accommodate the ignorance of the ignorant. Jesus Christ did not change his doctrine so that the people will not go away. In fact, when many of them went away, instead of changing the truth, they said, This is the truth, the truth that says, This is the truth, the truth that prepares you for heaven. Will you also go away? Which teachers should learn something? Which preachers should learn something? And those of us who are pastoring God's people should learn something. When people doubt, we don't change. When people oppose, we don't change. When people attack the world, we don't change. When people argue against the world, we don't change. When people say, I'll go to another church, I'll go to another assembly. This one is too tough for me. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. We don't change. We keep to the word of God. You know why? Because that's the way. That's the only thing that will take them to heaven. If you change the word of God so that the people will stay and abide, you're not preparing people for heaven. You're preparing a denomination. You're preparing in a, a religious assembly and you are not interested in religious assembly people who are going through the wilderness who are going to die in the wilderness my own congregation will not die in the wilderness and so you must keep on teaching the word emphasizing the word understanding that this is the way what he needs and they will get to heaven in jesus name and jesus when jesus said i am the bread that came from heaven it means number one i'm the source of life what it is in the physical in the natural if you're going to have life you must have bread you must have food you must have something to eat he said number one i am the source of life number two i'm the sustainers of life once you are born and you start eating for that life to be sustained you must keep on eating and jesus said i am that bread from heaven number one is the source of life number two is the sustainers of life number three is the sufficiency of life the sufficiency for life what kind of life eternal life what kind of life heavenly life what kind of life godly life what kind of life righteous life what kind of life abundant life what kind of life triumphant life what kind of life victorious life that's what he's telling us he's saying if you want to be victorious and triumphant you want to be heavenly righteous and godly here is the bread of life that will bring you that and i pray that it will be yours in jesus name Give me a good, good amen. amen. We come to point number two now. The, uh, is, uh, this is the supernatural strength through the manna from heaven. 
the su uh, supernatural strength through the manna from heaven. We're coming back to John chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 47 all through to verse uh, 51. We're looking at uh, John chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 47. It says, verily, verily. Anytime it says that, it says, you can be sure of this one. As it says, uh, firmly. It says, uh, surely. It says, certainly. It says, without a shadow of doubt, I tell you, he that believeth on me has everlasting life. And then go to verse 48. I am the bread of life. That's what the Jews did not understand. I am the bread of life. Look at verse 49. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. You know what he's saying there? He said, that manna you ate, your father's ate in the wilderness, that's just food. Angel's food, but it's just food. It was to your body. And eventually the body will die. And the body will go to the grave. And that's what happened to your fathers. They ate the manna in the wilderness, and now they are dead. Then he goes on to tell us in verse 15, he said, this is the bread, pointing at himself. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man be eat and tell me. That a man be eat thereof, tell me out loud, and not die. Verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man is available for you, whosoever will, any man, any woman, in any age, in any generation, I pray you'll partake of Christ. Amen. You'll have eternal life. Amen. You'll have everlasting life. And you will live forever in Jesus' name. Amen. It says, if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. He shall live forever. Amen. A boy, a girl, this available for you. A man, a woman, this available for you. A believer, a child of God, this available for you. And he says, the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, you see what Jesus Christ was saying. We need to understand this. Look at verse 47. Verse 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me has everlasting life. That sentence is uh, one of the shortest, briefest, simplest, clearest statements that Jesus made recorded in John. It shows the way of salvation. It shows the word of salvation. It shows the wonder of salvation. You understand? Understand this. When you hear a simple word, I understand that. That one is clear. That one is comprehensible. I understand that one. What you should do is this. You try to interpret the difficult by the simple. This one is simply verse 47. And as you understand this, you take that meaning of verse 47 to verse 48, 49, 50, and 51. You understand the unknown by applying what you already know. And you understand that which is hard by that which is clear. You understand what is obscure by that which is plain. Look at verse 47 again. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me has everlasting life. Don't you understand that? I said, don't you understand that? He said, I am the source of life. Believe on me, you have everlasting life. He said, I'm the sustainer of life. Believe on me, and your life in Christ in God will continue. I'm the sufficiency of all life. And believe on me, and you're going to have 
a sufficient life, supernatural life. That's what he said in verse 47. What he then says later, verse 48, I am the bread of life. That's very simple now. He's saying that as bread sustains the physical life, so I sustain the spiritual life. He says in verse 49, Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Because that one is just physical food, natural food. Even though it came from heaven from God, just like rain comes from heaven. Like the crops that grow because of the rain coming from heaven. And the waters God gave us from heaven. And the whole earth was created by the word, spoken word of authority. It spoke from heaven. But then it's natural. They are eating and they are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven. And so, if you want to go to heaven, the life of heaven, the life of godliness is sustained by the food that comes from heaven. By the meal that comes from heaven. By the manna that comes from heaven. That you may eat and not die. And then it says very clearly now, I am the living bread. Just like you said, I am the living water. He told that woman, if you knew who is asking you for water, natural water, you will ask him and he will give you water that you will not thirst anymore. He says, if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. So what he's saying is that if any man will believe on me, he will live forever. And the bread which I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And the Lord is telling us a very simple thing. Number one, Christ came from heaven. Christ came from heaven. That's what Nicodemus said. We know that what a teacher come from God. But no man can do this miracles that that doeth except God be with him. That one is very clear. Bread is for life. That's very clear. And Christ came from heaven. And Christ is for life. And this bread of life came from heaven. He supplies life. He sustains life. The heavenly life by giving himself. Now you understand, there are words we call metaphors. Metaphors. These are pictorial words, pictorial words that we use in describing some things. For example, we are hungry. For example, we are seeking bread. For example, we receive the bread. And we eat the bread for life. Now, instead of the word hungry, which word relates with the physical? We use the word we desire. You're hungry. You desire. You're hungry. You seek. You desire. You seek. You are hungry. You seek for food. Somebody gives you the food. You receive that food. We desire eternal life. And that eternal life comes from Christ. And we receive Christ. We believe on Christ. And because we believe on Christ, now we have salvation. Now we have eternal life. Now we have a new life. And that this for spiritual life, this for spiritual nourishment, this for spiritual satisfaction. When you eat, you grow. As we take of Christ and the word of Christ, then we grow. We have strength when we eat. And when you have the word of God and you have Jesus Christ, you have strength, you have refreshing, you have a persevering life. Think about it now. Without bread, that is the normal food, the physical food, without bread, without food, we're weak, we're weakened, we're enfeebled, we're sickly. We're vulnerable. Any disease that comes, the man is not eating. The woman is not eating. There is nothing internally to fight back against the sickness, against the disease. And so we say, without food, we're vulnerable. Without food, we're ineffective. Without food, we're powerless. Why can't you carry that thing, sir? 
I've not eaten for the past four days. So there's no stress. It is food that gives us the stress. Without food, we're fragile. Without food, we're exhausted. We walk in little, we're tired, we're worn out, we're fragile, we're exhausted. Without food, we're overcome by any kind of force, any kind of power. Without food, we're tired. Without food, eventually, if a person goes on like that, two days, three days, ten days, twenty days, forty days, fifty days, he doesn't eat anything at all. What's the final thing? I said, what's the final thing? Without food, we die. Now, Christ is telling us the same thing. He said, what you know in the physical, transfer that to the spiritual. Without feeding on Christ and his word, without feeding on this manna come from heaven, the heavenly pilgrim, number one, is lifeless and light-hearted. Lifeless and light-hearted because Christ is our life. And Christ is our strength. And Christ is our power. Number two, without Christ, feeding on Christ, we're frail and fainting. Spiritually, we're frail. Spiritually, we don't have strength. Spiritually, we're anemic. Without Christ, feeding on Christ, number three now, we're beating, we're broken, we're backsliding. You see, if you don't have Christ, that will give you stamina, that will give you strength, that will give you power, that will give you divine, supernatural energy. You're beating in life. Temptations come, you're beating. Difficulties come, you're broken. And temptations come, you're backsliding. Number four, without feeding on Christ, we're weak and wavering. That's what he's telling us. He said, you need me because I am the bread of life. You need me because I'm the one to sustain the salvation that you have. Without that salvation and without Christ living on the inside of us. And strong within us will be weak and wavering. Number five, will be stressless and staggering. Look at the person that has not, you know, eaten for some time. He'll be walking like this, he'll be staggering. And he will not have any strength. The same thing spiritually. He says, I'm the bearer of life. And I'm the man that came from heaven and supposed to sustain your spiritual life. Without me, you are stressless and you are staggering. Number six, you are cowardly and compromising. You see a person that is not uh, strong, he cannot, if uh, uh, a, a, a dog is barking, he cannot run. And something is coming against him, he it, is afraid of everything, is fearful, is cowardly and compromising. Anything that comes, he submits. Anything that comes, he subjects himself to that because he doesn't have the strength to withstand whatever. And then number seven is faithless and faulty. A person that has no feeling on Christ, on the words of Christ, there's no confidence, there's no faith, there's no trust. It's faithless and it's faulty. You'll find somebody who is not eating the word of God because Jesus Christ is the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was with God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the person is not feeding on the word of God. He'll be vacillating and vulnerable. Vacillating and vulnerable. Where do you stand? I don't really know. Do you, are you here? Are you there? He's not taking the word. He doesn't have any sure ground. He doesn't have any sure foundation. Because of that, he's vacillating and vulnerable. He's fearful and feeble fearful and feeble you know he does cannot confront anything cannot stand he falls for everything not only that he's so settled and unstable it's the word of god that makes us solid makes us stable and makes us settled but a person that is not feeding on christ that's what he's saying he said you need me because i am the bridge that came from Heaven, a person that is not feeding on Christ is failing and falling. Failing 
and falling. And eventually, you know, he says, I'm born again. I'm a child of God. I raised up my hands sometimes. I received Jesus as my personal savior. But it's not feeding on Christ. It's not feeding on the word of Christ. Eventually, he'll be dying and dead. Dying and dead. But you know, when you feed on the word of God, you will be strong. And thank God tonight you are getting stronger. Amen. You are getting more enlightened. Amen. Now you understand what Jesus said when he said, I am the bread that came from heaven. Look at chapter 6 verse 47. Chapter 6 verse 47. But really, really I say unto you, he that believeth on me has everlasting life. You have everlasting life. Because we're told in John chapter 3 verse 16, John chapter 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but what does he have? Everlasting life. Look at verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Look at verse 36 there. In verse 36, he that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him the wrath of god will not abide on you Amen. because you believe on the lord jesus christ as your savior as a redeemer as a final sacrifice as a substitute as the one that has come to take your sins away behold the lamb of god that taketh away the sin of the world and because you believe that your sins are forgiven he sets you free from that yoke and that bondage and that pressure and that overpowering evil that is called sin. We're coming to chapter 6, verse 48. Chapter 6 of John, verse 46. I am the bread of life. You understand that tense there? He didn't say, I was. He said, I am. He didn't say, I will be, but I am. In every generation, and to every family, and to every individual, and to everyone that will realize I cannot save myself. Only Christ can save me. Today, I am the bread of life. Look at verse 33. In verse 33, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Gives eternal life. Gives abundant life, gives everlasting life, gives the supernatural life, the victorious life to everyone in the world. Look at verse 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Look at verse 51. In verse 51, it tells us, I am, I am, not I will be, this is not future, not I was, not in the past, it's the ever-present I am. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, and he shall live forever. Somebody there will live forever. Yeah. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And you see what the Lord himself has affirmed. And what he has taught. That as he gives us himself. As he has sacrificed himself for salvation. And will believe on him. This salvation will be yours in Jesus name. We we'll come to point number three now. The sufficient sacrifice of the mediator. The mediator our only hope. I'm reading from verse 52. We're looking at John chapter 6 verse 52. The Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us 
is flesh to it. Again, you understand? They were thinking about it in the physical, in the natural. It's like you don't have any bucket to draw water. When you have that water of life, that living water, and Jesus said, this is what you are talking about. You drink it, you'll come back again because you'll be thirsty again. The one I'm going to give you is going to be flowing out of the depths of your being unto life eternal. And so they were making it physical here. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh, of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Huh. How do you understand that one? And let's look at First Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 14. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. First Corinthians, tell me the chapter. Tell me your verse. Okay, open it now. It says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Here Jesus was talking about something spiritual and something supernatural, something you know, about the heavenly life. And it says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. How can we drink his blood? How can we eat his flesh? That's foolish. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Come back to chapter 6, verse 61. Chapter 6, verse 61. John chapter 6, verse 61. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at him, those are shallow disciples. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at him, these were superficial disciples. When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, that these were half-hearted disciples, he said unto them, Does this offend you? What if, what an Eve, ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. Listen to verse 63. It is the spirit that quickness, the flesh profiteth nothing. The flesh profiteth nothing. Already he was telling them, I'm not telling you to eat my literal flesh. The flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak unto you, tell me, the spirit and their life. It says, the word is part of me. It's the word of life. It's the word of eternal life. It's the word of power. It's the word that communicates strength unto you. If you understand that, you'll not be saying, will he give us his flesh to eat? Look at chapter 8, verse 43. John chapter 8, verse 43. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. He said, if you wanted to hear my word, if you make up your mind to believe, it's very simple. All I'm saying is that when you believe on me, you have salvation and you have eternal life he spoke about those three about two things here he spoke number one about his flesh he spoke number two about his blood let's look at number one his flesh we're looking at ephesians chapter 2 ephesians chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 15 his flesh his flesh in chapter 2 of ephesians and in verse 15 look at what it says Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. You know what he's saying? He's saying that I'm the final sacrifice. I'm the sufficient sacrifice. I'm the atoning sacrifice. I'm the one that will go to the cross of Calvary and die for you. Because it is that 
death of Christ at Calvary that will abolish the enmity between man and God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 15 and having abolished in his flesh the enmity even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace. It brings peace between the sinner and God. It brings reconciliation between the man and the almighty God. Then it says in verse 16, And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And he came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them which were nice. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, the, now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you believe that he sacrificed himself, he made the atonement for you, and that he shared his blood, and through that veil of his uh, flesh, you now can come to Christ. He says, now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the saints and of the household of God. I pray this will be your Lord in Jesus' name. Colossians chapter 1 verse 21 verse 22. Colossians chapter 1 verse 21 verse 22. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now... As he reconciled, listen to this, reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. You see that? All he was saying is that I'm going to die for you. And I'm going to sacrifice my very life for you. And he says in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. As you believe, he'll wash you clean. He'll punch your life. He'll turn your life around. You'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. We're talking about his flesh. His flesh. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of jesus look at this by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh his body was broken for you his flesh was turned for you so that he'll make a way for you now to come to the heavenly father and having an high priest over the house of god let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast the profession of what our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised and so you see when he spoke about his flesh he was talking about his sacrifice the dead will die for you and for me and for everyone on the on the cross of calvary and then he spoke about his blood his blood and let's look at uh, you know what his blood does we're looking at romans chapter 5 romans chapter 5 uh, and we're reading from verse 9. Romans chapter 5. We're reading from verse 9. In verse 9 it says, Much more than being now justified by his blood. That's what it means. It doesn't mean you drink his literal blood. It shed the blood for you already on the cross of Calvary. And you believe on, that, on the cleansing power of that blood. It says, We shall be saved from wrath through him. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 7. The efficacy of his blood. It tells us, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. We have redemption through his blood. We have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. 
you know that he has died for you and you say yes lord i believe and because you believe in the efficacy of that blood your sins will be washed away first john chapter 1 verse 7 first john chapter 1 we're reading from verse 7 first john chapter 1 reading from verse 7 but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another look at this and the blood of tell me jesus christ his son what does he do cleanseth us from all sin as the blood is shed for you and as you believe that it will cleanse you from all sin it brings us to this hope and this is the only hope that's why what is said the sufficient sacrifice of the mediator is our only hope we're coming to first peter chapter one verse three first peter chapter one verse three blessed be god and father of our lord jesus christ which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto tell me a lively hope he has begotten us again to tell me a lively hope by the resurrection of jesus christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you thank god you'll get there Amen. who are kept by the power of god through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time it's revealed to you today Amen. you are going to believe you are going to have it in jesus name Amen. first john chapter 3 verse 1 first john chapter 3 verse 1 behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us god loves you i say god loves you Amen. say god loves me what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. When are we the children of God? When are we the people of God? When does that flesh of Jesus and blood of Jesus, when does he give us life? now beloved now are we the sons of god and it does not yet appear what we shall be but we know thank god i know thank god i know but we know that when it shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is everybody verse three one two three go Read that again with a strong voice. One, two, three, go. Read it now like a pilgrim going to heaven. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. That blood will make you pure. Yeah. Will keep you pure. Yeah. Prepare you for heaven. Yeah. I see candidates of heaven right there today. Yeah. You'll be there in Jesus' name. Yeah. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. He has taught us deep and rich things today in the word of God. And we need to take that to the Lord in our prayer. He gives us fullness of life. He is the heavenly manner.